لبيك إن الحمد والنعمة لك والملك لا شريك لك لبيك اللهم لبيك لبيك لا شريك All praise is due to Allah. May Allah bestow His peace and blessings upon our Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Hajj is one of the main pillars of Islam. Though from the blessings of Allah, it is only compulsory once in one's lifetime. Therefore, we advise all Muslims who intend to perform Hajj that they shouldn't begin the journey until they learn the manner in which the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam performed it so that they can follow his perfect example, obeying his command, when he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said, Take your hajj rights from me. وَإِذْ بَوَّأْنَا لِإِبْرَاهِيمَ مَكَانَ الْبَيْتِ أَلَّا تُشْرِكْ فِي شَيْئًا وَطَهِّرْ بَيْتِيَ لِلطَّائِفِينَ وَالْقَائِمِينَ وَالرُّكَّعِ السُّجُودَ وَأَذِّنْ فِي النَّاسِ بِالْحَجِّ يَأْتُوكَ رِجَالًا وَعَلَى كُلِّ ضَامِرٍ وَعَلَى كُلِّ ضَامِرٍ يَأْتِينَ مِنْ كُلِّ فَجٍ عَمِيقٌ The blessed city of Mecca, in it is the ancient house of Allah, towards which ye in the hearts of Muslims from all over the world. The faces and hearts are directed towards it in a state of humility and submission to Allah five times in the day and night. To it, Muslims come from every deep and distant mountain highway in order that they may perform their Hajj rituals. This has been from the time that Ibrahim alayhi salam built it in accordance with the command of Allah so that the believers could respond to the call of Allah to his house. And thus, the blessed Kaaba became the first place for mankind to worship Allah alone. The blessed Kaaba was established so that the believers may worship Allah upon a clear guidance and pure belief. إن أول بيت وضع للناس للذي ببكة مباركا وهدى للعالمين فيه آيات بينات مقام إبراهيم ومن دخله كان آمنا ولله على الناس حج البيت من استطاع إليه سبيلا ومن كفر فإن الله غني عن العالمين. From the moment that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala willed for the radiant sun of Islam to rise, He, the Almighty, sent His final prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with the religion of truth to make it victorious over all other religions, to make clear for mankind the aspects of ignorance and misguidance they had fallen into, and to make plain the reality of worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Islam has been established on five pillars. One, bearing witness that there is none worthy of worship except Allah, and that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. Two, to establish the five prayers. Three, to pay the zakat. Four, to fast the month of Ramadan. Five, and to perform hajj. So the hajj is one of the pillars of Islam. A person who has the means and ability has not fulfilled the duties of Islam until he performs the hajj. And it is compulsory upon every Muslim who has reached the age of maturity, is sane, and is living in freedom once in one's lifetime. King Abdullah ibn Abdul Aziz believes firmly in the importance of his obligation and the necessity in offering the best of services for everyone who arrives to perform this religious ritual. Hence, the kingdom of Saudi Arabia has employed its entire human and material capacities and has directed all of its ministers to the services of the guests of Ar-Rahman for their comfort and safety. They are surrounded by the care of Allah, Azza wa Jal. So don't hesitate in taking advantage of all of these services. Dear Muslim and honorable guest, welcome to the land of the two holy sanctuaries. Al-Hajj <laughs> 
فمن فرض فيهن الحج فلا رثة ولا فسوق ولا جدال في الحج وما تفعلوا من خير يعلمه الله وتزودوا فإن خير الزاد التقوى واتقون يا أولي الألباب There are three ansat, or three acts of devotion for performing the hajj. Each nusuk, or type of devotion, has specific characteristics, obligatory aspects, and components which must be performed for the person's hajj to be deemed correct. The three ansat are tamattur, qiran, and ifrad. The best of them in the sight of Allah is the tamattur. This is for the person who has not brought the sacrificed animal with him from the miqat or prescribed station. As for the tamattur, a person performs Umrah during the months of Hajj. He will be released from the ihram of Umrah by finishing tawaf, sa'i, having his hair cut, so everything which was made forbidden for him by the ihram becomes lawful again. On the eighth day of Dhul Hijjah, the pilgrim assumes ihram again. However, this time he makes the intention for Hajj. This he does at whichever place he is staying, in Mina, or Mecca, and then moves to Al Mash'ar Hajj station of Mina, east of Mecca, and completes the rest of the Hajj rituals. It is also binding that the pilgrim offers a sacrifice of an animal, but if the pilgrim is unable, he should fast three days during Hajj and another seven days when he has returned to his home country. Finally, there is Al Ifrad, and this is that the pilgrim assumes the Ihram for Hajj alone. When the pilgrim reaches Mecca, he performs the Tawaf and Sa'i between Safa and Marwa, and remains in the state of Ihram until he completes the Nusuk. It is not required from the pilgrim in this case to sacrifice an animal because he is not combining Umrah and Hajj. The best of these three Ansat is Tamattur, followed by Qiran and then Ifrad. The rituals of Hajj are initiated with the Ihram, which the intention for initiating the whole Nusuk. It is compulsory to assume ihram at the prescribed stations called mawaqit, which have been assigned, established, and explained. For those who are coming from different directions, the mawaqit are as follows. Dhul Hulayfa. This is the miqat for the people of al Medina. Al-Juhfa is the miqat for the people of Asham, that is, Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, and Palestine. Qarnul Manazil, this is for the people of Najd, it's between Ta'if and Mecca. Yalamlam, this is the miqat of the people of Yemen. Dhatu Iruq, this is the miqat for the people of Iraq. As for the people of Mecca, they assume ihram for hajj at their home. But if they intend to perform umrah, they must assume ihram from a place called Etanaim or any place outside the boundaries of the haram. So whoever intends to perform the hajj or umrah, it is compulsory upon them that they assume their ihram at the miqat which they came through or pass parallel to. He who deliberately passes by or parallel to the Malakit with the intention of Umrah or Hajj and without assuming Ihram must return to one of them and assume Ihram there. If the pilgrim does not return then he must sacrifice a sheep as an expiation in Mecca and distribute its meat amongst the poor people. So dear Muslims, when you arrive at the Miqat by land in a car or otherwise Bathe and apply perfume to your body. If you are able to, then put on the clothing of ihram consisting of two clean white sheets, one as a lower garment and one as an upper garment. As for female pilgrims, they may wear any clothing of their choice without making their beauty apparent with cosmetics or otherwise. 
Then you should make your intention of ihram, of umrah, by saying, Labaik umrah, meaning, Here I am, O Allah, in response to your call for umrah. The one who intends hajj tamattu' should say, Labaik umratun wa mutamattu'un biha ila hajj, meaning, Here I am, O Allah, in response to your call, making umrah, then after that, hajj. The one who intends qiran should say, Labaik umratun wa hajjun, meaning, Here I am, O Allah, in response to your call, making Umrah with Hajj. The one who attends Ifrad should say, Labaik Hajjan, meaning, O oh Allah, here I am, in response to your call, making Hajj. After assuming your Ihram for Hajj or Umrah, you have entered the Nusuk, which prohibits you from certain actions which are as follows. The removal of the hair or nails, but if some hair falls out unintentionally, or if you trim the hair or nails out of forgetfulness or from ignorance, not knowing of the ruling, then there is no expiation due from you. To apply any perfume either on the body or the clothing, there is no problem with the traces of perfume remaining which was applied prior to assuming ihram. To embark on the hunting of wild animals, whether to kill or chase them away or even to assist someone in doing so. To fell trees or cut green plants from the area of the haram, this applies if one is in a state of ihram or not. Also, to pick up lost property in the haram area except to announce its discovery. To make a proposal or a contract of marriage, whether for oneself or for someone else. One must not have sexual relations with women whilst in ihram, nor having any contact with women involving passion or lust. It is forbidden for a woman in ihram to wear gloves on her hands and likewise to veil her face completely or partially unless she is in the presence of strange men. In which case it is compulsory for her to veil her face as if she was not in the state of ihram. From the prohibited actions for men is the covering of the head with the ihram sheet or anything similar which is in contact with the head. As for seeking shade from the sun or the roof of a vehicle or the carrying of luggage upon the head, then there is no harm in that. If one does cover his head in the prohibited manner out of forgetfulness or ignorance, then he must remove the covering immediately once he remembers or becomes informed of the ruling. Also, from the prohibited actions of ihram are the wearing of sewn clothing, whether on all or part of the body, such as the grat shirt, cloak, trousers, caps, or leather socks. Except if one does not have the white waist sheet, he can wear trousers or doesn't have sandals, he can then wear leather socks. There would be no blame on him. It is permissible for one in ihram to wear sandals, rings, glasses, watches, hearing aids, a belt, and a pouch to safe keep his money and documents. Likewise, it is allowed to change one's ihram clothing or to clean it also to bathe one's head and body. In doing so, if some hair falls unintentionally, then there is no blame. If one is afflicted with an injury or wound, then that does not affect his state of ihram. There is no specific salat to be performed for ihram as many think and have come to believe. As such, it is compulsory upon those who intend to perform Hajj or Umrah and all Muslims in general that they adhere only to that which Allah have enjoined upon them from the obligations such as Salah at its prescribed time in congregation and that they avoid committing sin, acts of disobedience, outrages and other similar actions. It is also forbidden for all the pilgrims in the state of Ihram to perform any sexual acts. The journey takes us to the noble city of Mecca where there is the ancient house of Allah. It is recommended that the pilgrim takes a complete bath on his arrival. When he enters the Masjid al-Haram, he should enter with his right foot and say, I seek refuge with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his noble face, his everlasting authority from the accused shaitan. Oh Allah, open the doors of your mercy for me. This supplication is prescribed on entering all mosques. Next, the pilgrim thus travels to the noble Kaaba to begin the tawaf. It is from the sunnah for the men during the tawaf of arrival to make ibtiba, which involves uncovering the right shoulder, placing the middle of one's upper sheet under the right armpit and the two ends of the sheet on the left shoulder. Then the pilgrim begins a tawaf of seven circuits, beginning at the black stone, and if it is possible to get close to it, then he should kiss the stone. If he is able to, without harming the people by way of crowding, pushing, abusing, or fighting, as all of that is certainly wrong, and doing so harms the Muslims. It is sufficient in such a crowd to point at the black stone from afar and saying, Allahu Akbar. By this, the pilgrim begins his tawaf, constantly making dhikr of Allah, seeking his forgiveness, and calling upon him by whatever supplication he chooses. Or, he may recite the Qur'an, but without raising his voice, 
with specific supplications the way some people do, as doing so disturbs and confuses the other pilgrims performing tawaf. When the pilgrim reaches the Yemeni corner, the corner of the Kaaba facing Yemen, he touches it with his hand if it is easy to do so. One should not kiss or wipe it as some people do in contradiction to the manner of the Prophet Wasallam. If it is not easy for one to touch the Yemeni corner, then the pilgrim should move on without pointing at it or saying Allahu Akbar. With this, the pilgrim completes his tawaf as he began performing in total seven total such circuits, each time beginning at the black stone and ending there. Likewise, it is from the way of the Prophet Wasallam to make a run which is to hasten while walking, making short quick steps during the first three circuits from the Tawaf al qudum It will be noticed that there are a number of errors committed by some pilgrims during Tawaf. A major error is to pass inside the Hijr during Tawaf believing that it is a part of the Tawaf path, when in reality, passing inside the Hijr actually invalidates the Tawaf. The reason being that the pilgrim will have cut short his Tawaf by traveling within part as to what is actually the Kaaba instead of around it as is prescribed. The wiping or even the touching of all the corners of the Kaaba or its walls, curtains and its doors, the same applies for the Maqam Ibrahim. All these acts are forbidden because they are all innovations and therefore have no basis in the prescribed law of Islam and the Prophet wasallam, did not do any of them. It is also not allowed to raise one's voice during Tawaf as doing so causes disturbance and confusion to the other pilgrims. The female pilgrims competing and crowding with the men, particularly near the Hajar al-Aswad and the Maqam Ibrahim. So, dear pilgrim, it is compulsory upon you that you avoid all of these errors and incorrect practices. As soon as you have completed your tawaf, you should hasten to cover your right shoulder. It is an emphasized sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam after completing the tawaf to pray two raka'ah behind Maqam Ibrahim if it is easy to do so. Otherwise, one may pray the two raka'ah anywhere in the Masjid al-Haram. Next, move to the Mount of as safa for the seven journeys of Sa'i. When you approach as safa you should begin with that which Allah Azza wa Jal began with in His Ayah. Certainly, as safa and Al-Marwa are from amongst the symbols of Allah Azza wa Jal. So, it is not a sin upon him who performs Hajj or Umrah to perform the Tawaf between them. Whoever does good actions voluntarily, then be sure that Allah is the All-Grateful and the All-Knowing. Then you step onto a part of Mount as safa and whilst facing the Kaaba with raised hands, Praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and glorify and supplicate to Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. Next, the pilgrim descends as safa facing and heading towards Al-Marwa, walking and constantly supplicating to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for Himself, His family, and all believers using whichever supplications that are becoming for Him. When the pilgrim reaches the first green sign, he should run at a quick pace until he reaches the second green sign. Then he continues walking as normal until he arrives at Al Marwa. This running is to be performed by the male pilgrims only and not the females. When you arrive at Al Marwa, face the Kaaba and repeat the supplications which you said on climbing as Safa. Then, Make supplications as you will. After that, you descend and walk back until you reach the green sign where you run quickly again until you arrive at the second green sign. Then you complete the walking as usual until you climb as safa In this manner, you complete your seven journeys. So, your traveling from as safa to Al-Marwa is one complete journey. And your returning to Al-Marwa from as safa is another complete journey. If you begin the Sa'i walking and you become exhausted, or you were afflicted with pain due to an accident or other health problems, then there would be no blame on you if you were to complete your sa'i riding a wheelchair. 
It is permissible for the menstruating woman and those in their after childbirth <coughs> conditions to perform the sa'i but not the tawaf of the Kaaba because the path between as safa and Al-Marwa is not included inside Al-Masjid Al-Haram. The female pilgrims should not hurry between the green signs during the sa'i as this is from the mistakes often committed. After completing the sa'i, the male pilgrim has the hair from his head cut short if he is performing Hajj at Tamattur. He must make sure that his hair is cut evenly all over his head. As for the female pilgrim, then they should only cut from their hair a length equivalent to a finger joint from the end of one finger. This should not be done in the presence of non-mahram pilgrims. With this, the pilgrim performing the Hajj at Tamattur has completed his Umrah. So everything that the state of Ihram prohibited him from now becomes permissible for him again. A person performing the Hajj or Umrah should recite the Talbiyah in abundance and at its proper times, which for Umrah are from the time one assumes Ihram till he begins the Tawaf and for Hajj from the time one assumes Ihram till when he stones the biggest pillar on the morning of Eid. On the eighth day of Dhul Hijjah, the day of Tarweeh, the pilgrims in their state of Ihram and with their different and sat head towards the plain of Mina, following the way of the Prophet It is recommended to head for Mina before the sun reaches its meridian. It is for the beginning of the time for Salatul Dhuhr. The pilgrims then pray at Mina, the Salah of Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib, Isha, and Fajr, shortening those with four raka'ah to two. Each prayer should be performed at its prescribed time, so no two prayers are combined. This applies whether one is a resident of Mecca or not. It is from the Sunnah for the pilgrim to spend the night in Mina on the day of Tarweeh until he prays the Fajr on the night of Dhul Hijjah. He then waits until the sun has clearly risen and travels towards Arafah in a quiet, peaceful and tranquil manner, constantly reciting the Tarweeh and saying, Allahu Akbar. The ninth day of Dhul Hijjah, the day of Arafah, the groups of pilgrims arrive at the plain of Arafah on this witness day, which the Messenger of Guidance, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, described as the best of days. The pilgrim spends this great day on the plain of Arafah from the time the sun rises until it sets completely. It is from the Sunnah to stop temporarily at Namira, if that is possible, and to perform the Salat of Dhuhr and Asr, shortened and combined at the beginning time of Dhuhr. If one is unable to stop at Namira, one must make sure that the place where he camps is within the boundaries of Arafah. There are a number of signs and guidance boards which clearly show the boundaries. The whole plain of Arafah is a place for standing. So, dear pilgrim, on this great day, you must strive in preoccupying yourself with the Talbiyah and Dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You should also seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in abundance along with the Glorifying him by saying Allahu Akbar and by proclaiming his oneness saying La ilaha illallah. You must turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a state of submission and humiliation and you must strive hard with supplication to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for yourself, your family, your children and for your fellow Muslims. When the time of Dhuhr arrives, the Imam addresses the people with a sermon that consists of reminders and guidance. After that, he will lead the pilgrims in performing Dhuhr and Asr combined and shorten the two raka'ah each in the way that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa Acted. No one should perform any prayer before, after, or between these two. You must avoid making certain errors that ruin the recompense and reward of this great day and noble place. From these errors, which are often committed by some pilgrims, are some pilgrims arriving at Arafat come outside its boundaries, remaining there until the sun has set, and then they move towards Muzdalifa having not spent any time inside the plain of Arafah. Leaving from Arafah before the sun has set completely, and this is not allowed, as it is in contradiction to the practice of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, crowding together and pushing one another in order that they may climb the mountain of Arafah and reach its summit, also wiping the hand against it, performing salah upon it. And this is from the innovations having no basis in the Sharia. Furthermore, as a consequence of such climbing and new practices, people suffer unnecessary physical harm and damage to their health. Facing the mountains of Arafah when supplicating to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when the sunnah is to face the Qibla. 
ليس عليكم جناح أن تبتوا فضلا من ربكم فإذا أفضتم من عرفات فاذكروا الله عند المشعر الحرام واذكروه كما هداكم واذكروه كما هداكم وإن كنتم من قبله لمن الضالين ثم أفيضوا من حيث أفاض الناس واستغفروا الله إن الله غفور رحيم Al Muzdalifah. When the sun has set on the ninth of Dhul Hijjah, the pilgrim travels with the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the direction of Al Mash'al Al Haram, which is Al Muzdalifah. There, they perform the Salah of Maghrib and Isha, combined and shortened with one Adhan and two Iqamah. This should be done immediately upon arrival. The pilgrims spend the rest of the night in Muzdalifa sleeping. Upon arrival at Muzdalifa, some pilgrims commit certain errors which one needs to be cautioned against. Among these errors are the following. The pilgrims turn their attention toward gathering the small stones prior to performing the two salah of Maghrib and Isha combined and shortened when the salah is the foremost. The belief of some pilgrims that all the stones for the jimar must be collected at Muzdalifa is another error one must avoid falling into. It is from the sunnah, as we have already mentioned, that the pilgrims spend their night at Muzdalifa until they perform Salatul Fajr. It has been made permissible for the women, the weak, and the infants to leave for Mina during the night after the moon has disappeared. When the pilgrim has performed Salatul Fajr, it is recommended for him to stand at Al Mash'ar Al Haram, which is a mountain in Muzdalifa, or at any place within Muzdalifa to face the Qibla and to make dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in abundance together with the takbir and whichever supplications are easy for him. Next, the pilgrim proceeds to collect small stones for the ritual of Arami. He gathers seven small stones slightly bigger than chickpeas for the stoning of al jamratul Aqaba al-Kubara and the rest of the stones he collects at Mina. From there, the pilgrim continues his journey with the blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before the sun rises towards Mina, constantly reciting the talbiyah in a state of humility and making dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in abundance. When the pilgrim arrives at Mina, he should hasten in going directly to going to Jamratul Aqaba al-Kubara, which is the closest one to Mecca. Once at the Jamratul Aqaba al-Kubara, he stops saying the talbiyah and then throws al Jamratul Aqaba with seven small stones in succession, saying, Allahu Akbar, with each stone that is thrown. Next, the pilgrim slaughters the sacrificed animal. It is due from him and he eats of its meat and feeds the poor also. After that, he shaves or shortens the hair from his head, but to shave is better and more rewarding. As for the female pilgrim, they cut from their hair a length of one finger joint. To perform the rituals in the order mentioned is best. However, if one should change the order, then there is no harm in doing that. Takbirat, the tenth of Dhul Hijjah, the day of sacrifice, the Muslims from all over the world, and in particular the pilgrims gathered on the plain of Mina, the scene of the blessed day, Eid al-Adha, being happy and rejoicing over the favors that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has bestowed upon them. The people have slaughtered their sacrificed animals, seeking to draw nearer to Allah azza wa jal. The pilgrims will find the project of the kingdom of Saudi Arabia for utilizing the meat for sacrificed animals and excellent assistance to them for the performing of their nusuk. Takbirat. It is observed during the stoning of Jamarat that some pilgrims commit certain errors. We will mention some of them. The belief of some pilgrims that they are throwing stones at the shaitan. So they throw with great fury and anger accompanied by insults and cursing of the shaitan. When in reality, the throwing of stones at the jamra was not prescribed except as an establishment of the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Pelting the jamrat with large stones or even with shoes or even pieces of wood is an exceeding of the proper bounds and an exaggeration in the religion which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam forbade us from. Crowding, competing and fighting amongst each other in order to pelt the jamrat is a huge error. It is obligatory upon the pilgrim that he shows friendliness and gentleness to his fellow Muslims and to take care 
in throwing into the correct place, which is inside the basin, regardless as to whether the pillars are struck or not. Throwing the stones all together in a single stroke, in which case it would not be considered except as a single stone. The correct and legitimate way is to throw one stone after another and to recite Allahu Akbar with each stone. Once the pilgrim has pelted the Jamra to Aqaba and has shaved or shortened his hair, then the first releasing from the state of Ihram is complete for him. He can therefore wear his normal clothes again. Everything which was made forbidden for pilgrims due to the Ihram becomes allowed except for intimate contact with their spouses. Tawaful Ifadah Next, the pilgrim moves to Mecca in order to perform the Tawaful Ifadah. This is the main pillar, so the Hajj is not complete before performing it. He must also perform the Sa'i, after it, he is making Hajj at Tanattur. As for the ones performing the Hajj of Qiran or Ifrad, then they must perform Sa'i only if they did not do it previously with their Tawaf al Qudum. Once the pilgrim has completed the Tawaf al Ifada on the day of sacrifice, everything which was made prohibited by Ihram becomes allowed again, including intimate contact with their spouses. The Days of Tashriq. Next, the pilgrim returns to Mina to stay there for three days of Tashriq, which constitutes the nights of the 11th, the 12th, and the 13th. Or, if one wishes to leave early, he may remain only for two nights. In confirmation, the pilgrim must pelt the three Jamarat after the sun has passed its meridian on the days that are spent in Mina, and he should say, Allahu Akbar, with each stone that is thrown. It is from the Sunnah, after having pelted the small Jamarat, and then again after the middle Jamra, to stand facing the Qibla, with raised hands, and to supplicate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for whatever one wishes. As for the Jamra, closest to Mecca, which is Jamra to Aqaba, one does not stand nor supplicate after pelting it. For he who intends to stay only two days, he must pelt the three Jamarat on the twelfth day. After the sun passes its meridian, then he must leave Mina before the sun sets. For if the sun sets and he has not begun his journey to leave, there he must remain and stay for the night of the 13th and pelt the Jamarat on the 13th day. The Farewell Tawaf The journey takes us back to the noble city of Mecca one more time for the performance of the Tawaf around the ancient house, bringing the whole journey close to its completion. After the pilgrim has completed the performance of their ansak with all their pillars and obligations, then they should make their final act the farewell tawaf around the sacred house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In compliance with the order of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which was reported to have said, None of you should depart until he has made his final act at the house of Allah. So the farewell tawaf is the final obligation of the hajj which the pilgrim must perform immediately before his direct return journey to his home country. No one is excused from the farewell tawaf except the woman in menstruation or those in the post-childbirth conditions. The Prophet wasallam city, the manner of visiting the Prophet's mosque, the place towards which the Prophet wasallam migrated and where he was finally buried. We prepare for the journey of visiting the Prophet's mosque which is one of the three mosques besides which it is not allowed to make a specific journey towards as the Prophet ﷺ was reported to have said. Don't prepare for a specific journey towards any mosque except the three which are the sacred mosque in Mecca, my mosque and Masjid al-Aqsa. Visiting the Prophet's mosque is not a condition nor an obligation for Hajj. In fact, it has no connection or any relation to Hajj and there is no state of Ihram for it. However, visiting it is prescribed and recommended for any time throughout the year as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it possible and facilitated one's arrival at the land of the two holy sanctuaries. It would be highly recommended to travel to the city of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to perform salah in the Prophet's mosque in which a single salah is counted as being more superior than a thousand salah performed in any mosque except the Masjid al-Haram in Mecca in which one salah is superior to 100,000. Also, the person should give salutations to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Dear visitor, when you arrive at the Prophet's mosque, proceed with your right foot when entering and say,
I seek refuge with Allah, the Supreme, and His noble face, and His everlasting authority from the accused devil. O oh Allah, open the doors of your mercy for me. This supplication is prescribed to be recited upon entering all mosques. After entering the mosque, hasten to perform the two rak'ah of salah known as Tahayyatul Masjid. And how excellent it would be if this salah could be performed in a rawda But if that is not possible, then perform the salah at any place in the mosque. Next, go to the grave of the Prophet ﷺ and stand in front of it and face it. You should begin with salutation upon the Prophet ﷺ in a sensible manner and in a low voice, saying, Peace be upon you, O Prophet, and also the mercy of Allah and His blessings. Then, you should move a short distance to your right so that you stand in front of the grave of Abu Bakr as Siddiq. Then you should give him your salutations as you gave the Prophet ﷺ. Once again, you move a short distance on your right until you are standing in front of the grave of Omar. Then you give him your salutations as you did the Prophet ﷺ. It is noticed that some visitors to the Prophet ﷺ's mosque commit certain errors which are regarded as being innovations, all of which have no basis in the Sharia and are not reported from the actions of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with them all. Amongst the errors are the following. Wiping one's hand against the netting or the grill of the Prophet's room and walls of the mosque, facing the grave while supplicating to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when the correct way is to face the direction of the Qibla. After that, it is also recommended for you to visit the graves of those buried in al baqiyah in which are gathered the graves of a large number of the companions, amongst which is that of the third Khalifa, Uthman ibn Affan. May Allah be pleased with him. Likewise, one should visit the graves of the martyrs of the Battle of Uhud, which include the grave of the leader of martyrs, Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib. You should greet them. Assalamu alaykum ahl al-diyar min al-mu'minin wal-muslimin, wa inna insha'Allahu bikum lahiqoon, nas'alullaha lana wa lakum al-afiyya. It is also recommended that while you are in Medina, that you travel to Masjid Quba in a state of purity, which was the first mosque to be built in Islamic history. So you visited and performed salah inside it, as the Prophet ﷺ did and often encouraged others to do so. There are no other mosques or places besides these mentioned that are prescribed for you to visit in Medina. So a person should not inconvenience himself and take on traveling here and there to places for which there is no reward in visiting. It is most fitting upon the pilgrims of Hajj or Umrah when he returns to his home country that he should bear in mind what he has performed from the rituals of Hajj. We ask Allah the Most High to grant everyone a Hajj free from sin which he subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts and is pleased with and that he accepts with all our efforts.